Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. All right, uh, I am once again out in my uh, kitchen dining area playing a game of uh, Eldritch Horror this time. And uh, I have a Rocky Mountain Man set up in the hobby room. So yes, I am here just with a pretty brief look at Eldritch Horror, um, adding my water drop sized opinion to the sea of opinions already, uh, already established on this game. I don't know if I have anything really new or exciting to say about it, but hopefully I do. Um, this is a game that replaced Arkham Horror 2nd Edition for me. I think it is the better of the two games. And one of the main reasons why is I think it, it streamlined the game, but it didn't jettison anything that I loved about Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, like all of the random encounters and monsters and equipment and, and interesting things that can happen on the board. It just streamlined the actual gameplay. I know I've told this story before, but Arkham Horror 2nd Edition was one of the first games I got back into in my kind of like third wave hobby gaming. And it was far more complex than anything I was used to at the time, or I had been previously. And that game took me a long time to learn. I had to print out like flow charts from BGG. Uh, finally, the uh, Universal Head uh, Guide got me into playing the game with the correctly. So it took me a really long time to get into I almost gave up on Arkham Horror 2nd Edition just because I could not figure out how to play it. Uh, that is not the case with Elder Tor. Elder Tor is, 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 is a pretty simple game to learn and teach, and I think that's one of the best things about it. So I did want to talk a little bit about Lovecraftian uh, theming, and in the, especially in these Arkham file games and in other games like Cthulhu Death May Die and that kind of thing. I think a lot of times when people say something is Lovecraftian, it means more than just being like Lovecraft. It really points to the whole kind of like broader world of things that Lovecraft inspired. Because there really isn't a lot about Eldritch Horror that is reminiscent of the actual works of H.P. Um, Lovecraft. It is mostly based on the second or third generation of authors who contributed to the Cthulhu mythos. And the Cthulhu mythos, of course, was kind of like compiled and codified and popularized really by um, a publisher and author and anthologist, uh, August Derleth, who was the I think he published the first of Lovecraft stuff, but he also took it and combined it in ways and combined it with other authors' works in ways to create the whole Bible of the mythos. And then after that, you know, other authors contributed to those stories, to that world. And one of the authors who I think did that in the way that most benefited uh, board games, video games, and other media is Brian Lumley. And I did want to read a passage from the transition of Titus Crow here uh, with this great cover by Michael Whalen, one of the uh, Da Science Fiction Yellow Spines here. But uh, you'll get a real sense of like what I'm talking about. This is kind of a longer passage. But I did want to read it. Uh, there are going to be a lot of words that are very hard to pronounce, so I'm just going to kind of like uh, bumble my way through them. So uh, you can maybe see them on the page. So uh, let's start here. It says, um, I had learned initially and admittedly more than somewhat skeptically of the basic concepts of this unthinkably ancient mythology during my studies of certain allegedly pre-human books, documents, and manuscripts purported to contain magical devices and esoteric records immemorially handed down. Among such forbidden books I had read, the unsuppressed sections of the British Museum's photostat narcotic manuscript, supposedly a fragmentary record of a race lost before history began. Similarly, reproduced pages from the Relay texts purporting to have been written by certain minions of Great Cthulhu himself, the Unsuprechulan Culton, 
by von Junz and Ludwig Prinz de Vermis Misterlis, uh, both in vastly expurgate, expurgated editions. The Comte de Eretz, Cultures des Ghouls, the cultures, cults of ghouls, I believe, um, and Joachim Ferry's often fanciful notes on the Necronomicon, the hideously revealing and yet disquietingly vague revelations of Glocky, and those uncoded sections of Titus Crow's own priceless copy of the anonymous Chat Aquidigen. So as you can see, so Brian Lumley, his character Titus Crow, he has injected into the broader world of the fiction created by authors like Lovecraft, Derleth, and Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard and others. So these books and many others like them held the keys to the pantheon of the mythos, to the lists of gods and demons attached to it. In this way, I had learned of the benign elder gods, peacefully placid in Orion, but ever aware of the struggle between the races of earth and the forces of evil, and of those evil deities themselves, the great old ones, the goos, which we are uh, fighting against in Eldritch Horror. High in the ranks of the later group were such beings as Yog Sothoth, the All-in-One and the One-in-All, coexistent with all time and conterminous in the space, in all space, a primal slime frothing forever beyond the nethermost angles of this space-time continuum, wearing a uh, congress of iridescent globes to mask the absolute horror of his real form and design. Hastur, the unspeakable, often called him who is not to be named, a prime elemental of interstellar space and air, half-brother and yet sworn enemy of Cthulhu, residing near the Lake of Hali in the Hyades. Hyades. Ithaqua, the Wind Walker, another being of air and space, Shub Niggeroth, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, monstrous travesty of a god or goddess of fertility, Great Cthulhu himself, in utter contradiction of all matter, force, and cosmic order, whose lunatic telepathic sendings from his seat or prison somewhere beneath the Pacific Ocean were of such a morbid potency that they were responsible for much of Earth's madness, historic and contemporary. And Shudmael, lord of the nestmaster of the Chthonians, the Earth deities proper, a gigantic, sentient, subterranean slug, headless and eyeless, but seeing nevertheless and capable of organic tunneling through deeply buried rock as easily as a warm knife slicing butter. These then were some of the forces or gods of the ancient mythology, but there were many others. So like that page, those pages right there, that passage in, uh, Brian Lumley's The Transition of Titus Crow, which was originally published in the late 70s, I believe, uh, 1975, uh, really feels like a description of a game of Arkham Horror, or actually more precisely because of its worldwide scope of Eldritch Horror. So if you have not yet read Brian Lumley and you're into the Arkham File games, I do highly recommend them. So we read a few names in that passage, and what's interesting is I set up and played this game uh, before <laughs> remembering about that passage, but I chose to fight against Hastur, okay? So Hastur was mentioned in uh, that book. He is the great old one I am fighting. The mystery that I am working on right now is trying to close the gates uh, that are surrounding the uh, Lake Holly there, so cities on the lake. And uh, we also have out on the board on space four here, the Wind Walker this kind of like um, Bigfoot type, the weather grows worse, snow and ice cover cities and have never seen such weather before in their history. So this wind walker is creating some very nasty cold weather. We have to take care of him. An early mythos card had me discover the narcotic manuscripts. So <laughs> I really am kind of playing a board game of that passage from the transition of Titus Crow. And I do think it was Brian Lumley who kind of uh, solidified that idea of investigators, of humans banding together, 
with even the remote chance, remote possibility of facing off against the great old ones or doing some damage to the the, the gods, the pantheon. You know, um, he took it kind of to a worldwide scale and made it a little more pulpy, a little more like an action movie, which is kind of what Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror and uh, Mansions of Madness and Cthulhu Death May Die are. Uh, another one of his popular series is uh, the very silly but very entertaining Necroscope series, which is kind of like a X-Files meets Hellboy meets the uh, Cthulhu mythos meets vampires. Uh, lots of like secret societies and uh, you know, World War II fighting Nazis and globe-trotting adventures dealing with horrific entities and, and special psychic humans who can fight them. And then I also have this book here, which is part of the, um, the Chaosium series, and that is Strangers of Strange Songs. And these are tales celebrating Brian Lumley's contribution to the mythos fiction and also contains some stories by him. So yeah, if you're interested in these games, I do highly recommend you read some Brian Lumley. But let's uh, get back to the game here. I just kind of wanted to show that that literary connection that this game really does feel like a, a, a board game of a Brian Lumley story. So here are a few things that I really love about Eldritch Horror. Number one, I love these small box expansions. As a matter of fact, these are the only expansions I have for the game and I kind of considered my copy uh, finished. It's not complete, but I have basically everything I want for the game. And these four small expansions and the base game, they all fit within the base game box. And they are Forsaken Lore, Cities in Ruin, Signs of Carcosa, and Strange Remits. The reason I like these expansions a lot is that they really just add more variety to the things that are already present in the base game. So you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new rules and have a whole bunch of new different things it just adds more variety to the things you already have and to the rules you already know the few rules that are added like in strange remnants the um, idea of earning focus tokens as an action so normally um, you have a few actions you can take on a turn in the base game you could travel you could prepare for travel you could require assets you could rest you could trade or you could take an action on a, a piece of gear that you have but Strange Remnants added the um, idea of focus, taking a focus token for an action. And you can simply do that. You can take this token, add it to your character's gear, and then you can spend this token for a reroll. So a really nice way to uh, kind of prepare for what would be a big challenge coming up. Forsaken Lore just adds a whole bunch of cards to the decks you already have. Cities and Ruins does the same thing, but it also adds a deck of cards and a, and a and a, a mechanism where the cities out on the board, the spaces out on the board can get destroyed. I don't normally play with that part of the um, expansion because I think it makes the game even more difficult, but it is pretty cool. And the other things this game, this expansion adds are cool. And also Signs of Carcosa. And each one of these I believe also adds like a couple investigators and a uh, at least one great old one. Signs of Carcosa, um, is, um, of course, adding Hastur there because Hastur is associated with uh, Carcosa. But just really neat. I love Fantasy Flight's small box expansions. I've always felt that they were the best bang for your buck. They don't take up a lot of space. They can usually fit in the base game box and they're just fun. Uh, they're, 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 they're good size expansions. So um, another thing I really like about Eldritch Horror is once you have the game set up on the table, you really never have to go back in the box to dig through other components, to, to, to uh, take things out. You never really have to, uh, you know, you're not digging through tiles because it's a pre-set up board. And just once you get the game set up, the entirety of the game is focused on playing the game, not continuous uh, setup. So that is a really good thing that just keeps the focus on the board and on the game. Uh, one exception to that rule is while you are playing the game, your investigators will die a lot. The investigators in this game really are a kind of a resource that you are working through, kind of like the survivors in Kingdom Death Monster. And one of the things is 
as these investigators die, so you will, as the investigators die, you will have to like set up a new investigator, but setting up a new investigator in this game is, is, is very quick. You just uh, take the card, take the, the standee, and like one or two pieces of gear. But each time an investigator dies, if they die, they can either die by losing their uh, health or their sanity. Well, then you've put them on the board and you mark them with either a sanity uh, token or a health token, depending on how they died. And then that investigator actually becomes a, uh, a, a token that another live investigator can interact with to have another encounter. So it's a really creative kind of multi-use for these investigators. When they die, they're not out of the game. They become another kind of random encounter that you can have on uh, the board during your, your gameplay. So as you are getting expansions, as you are getting more cards to add to your various encounter decks, you're also getting more investigators, but those investigators also add to the number of random encounters that you can have during a game. Um, I also really like the modular nature of the uh, great old ones, the enemies, the, the bosses that you will be fighting against because each one of them comes with a deck of mysteries and these mysteries and in, in most games you have to solve three of these mysteries to win the game. Hasturi you only have to solve two and then they also come with a deck of um, of search cards here where you can get clues depending on where the clues are on the board. So you have these encounter cards, our research encounters, and then they also have these other special encounters. So you're going to get like two or three decks with each great old one that you're going to use specifically only when you are going up against that great old one. And so you have this kind of like modular deck system where you can every time you pick one of these you're going to be using a whole different new set of adventure cards again to keep that variety really high uh, there also there is a modular nature to some of the things in the small box expansions that you can use or don't have to use and so you can always kind of piece together the exact kind of game you want to play and that is also true with the mythos cards so the mythos phase in all of these games is that's when you draw a card and something bad happens well, as you start collecting the expansions in Eldritch Horror, you're going to get a huge stack of these. And there are normal, easy, and hard Mythos cards. And you can construct your, construct your deck using a combination of those to tailor the difficulty that you want to go up against in the game. And I really like that. That is a really, it's a really easy way to uh, keep, to, to allow the players to define their own difficulty. And finally, I do like the grand scope of this game. So many uh, Lovecraftian, Cthulhu Mythos style games, they're, they're very much kind of um, focused on the singular individual experience of the investigator, of a single um, person, that kind of thing. But Eldritch Horror takes it and expands it to a worldwide scope where you're having these worldwide globe trotting adventures. And it does feel different on a narrative and thematic level because of that. And finally, I, I love all of the little cards, all of the gear. There is so much cool gear that you can get in the game. And again, like every single card has new or a, a different unique art and just, it's always fun to get gear in this game. The deck of conditions you can get, each condition is double sided so you will have the thing that happens and then you will flip the card to have some kind of a repercussion of that thing happening and there are a ton of different abilities, tons of different conditions then you have a whole deck of unique assets, which are kind of like magical trinkets and relics and special items that you can get that are even more powerful than, than the mundane items. You have an entire deck of uh, spells. There's a huge deck of different spells and each one of those is double-sided with different uh, text on the back to show a different kind of result of you casting or failing the spell. You have relics, there are tons of just different decks of random encounters that you can have 
Some of them have multiple encounters on the same card. So just the, the sheer amount of variety in this game makes for a, 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 an experience where every game feels completely different, even though you are basically doing the same things on the board. So, all right, guys, well, that was just a, another little quick look at Eldritch Horror and a little detailed look at the works of Brian Lumley. And I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.